Harold Shipman was convicted on January 31st of the year 2000 in the deaths of 15 people. But he wasn't your average serial killer. He was a doctor that is now known as Dr. Death. Detectives were actually able to link him to more than 250 deaths that he uh, caused by his work as a doctor, purposefully caused as his work. When someone noticed uh, as working for the coroner that a lot of death certificates were coming in signed by Dr. Shipman. The reason, though, that I, I mention just briefly that story as we begin is that um, uh, the detectives became very aware as they were looking into this case that Dr. Shipman had a cloak of invincibility. Invincibility. He thought and he believed, and it was the um, purpose in all of his actions, he really honestly believed that nothing could stop him, that he would never be caught, that he was invincible, he could do whatever he wanted, and there would never be consequence to his actions. He had deceived himself into believing that he was almost supernaturally protected in, this, uh, in his actions, but it wasn't just him. It bled, that, that cloak of invincibility had bled into his patients. And after he was arrested, many of his patients came to his defense. One lady even told detectives that Dr. Shipman, quote, is like God himself, end quote. But Harold Shipman, of course, is not like God himself. He was not invincible. His sins found him out. He was deceived, and he was able to deceive others. Deception comes in many different types of shapes and sizes. It's not simply the immortality of the soul. It's not only the everlasting punishment of hellfire. It's not only the coming Sunday law, but it's also in other things. It's in those things, but it's more. Can we as Adventists be deceived? Are we susceptible to deception? Or are we invincible because of our church denomination? All deception is sneaky, and in many times the deception is simply self-reliance. Thinking that we are okay who we are or where we are. As we learned in Sabbath school this morning, we have to guard ourselves from the spirit of Antichrist, right? That spirit of Antichrist is salvation by works or self-reliance. And sometimes maybe as Adventists, because we know the gospel truth, we put up this wall of, nope, that's not us. We can't be deceived by that. We understand the gospel. But Satan knows that. And Satan, I'm sure, has plans on doing everything he can to bring that self-reliance, that pride within God's church. We must be aware of that. So as we take a look at one of the mistakes that we make prophetically, it's not so much in the prophetic message in which we believe and which is 100% correct, it's that sometimes as we look at ourselves as a church prophetically and we realize that we know what's going to take place and we keep the Sabbath and so how could we fall in that time? The mistake that we make is that sometimes this idea or these beliefs that are true give us an aura of invincibility which leads to pride and selfishness and, of course, the state of Laodicea, that lukewarmness in which we all kind of feel like everything is fine and dandy. We're okay. We know what we need to know. We've done what we need to do. And we're okay the way we are. Deception has led and will continue to lead us into delay. And delay is a cancer to the church. So I want to look at a couple Bible stories and remind ourselves first that we are weak and that we need to rely on Jesus. 
Israel was standing on the shore of the Red Sea. Certainly they were fearful, though, of what they saw, right? Put yourself this morning into their shoes. They're just coming out of a time of captivity. They have nearly almost forgotten their true God. They have forgotten his ways of righteousness. As they go into the wilderness, God will have to remind them all the things that he had already taught their fathers, Abraham and Jacob. And so they're fresh in their faith, and they certainly must have been scared, right? We can read this in Exodus chapter 14. Grab your Bibles, Exodus chapter 14. Notice how they're feeling as they're standing on the shore of the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 14, and we'll start our reading at verse 11. Exodus 14, notice what they say in verse 11 and 12. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians that, than that we should die in the wilderness. So I want to judge them for who they were, remind ourselves of who they were at that time. They were fresh in their faith. It should not be surprising that they are weak and babies in Christ, if you will, at this moment. It doesn't excuse why over the next 40 years they continue this whining and complaining as they march through the wilderness. Why later they're standing on the shore, if you will, of the promised land. God's like, go in and take it. And they're like, no. And he says, okay, you've missed your window. Don't go in and take it. Ah, and they go charging in. That doesn't excuse those actions, but here kind of makes sense. They're babies. They're just fresh into their faith steps. And so they're worried. They're scared. They're fragile. Moses, just like what a leader should do, gives them encouragement. He lifts their eyes up and says, don't worry about what you see. Know that God is with us. Let's keep reading. Verse 13 and 14, Moses says this. He, re, he uh, comes back with this, a rebuttal. Moses said to the people, do not be what, everyone? Afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Amen? Ah, oh, the Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. In other words, quiet down and watch what God's going to do. Hold your tongue. Was what Moses just said a failure? No. His words are absolutely perfect here. They're encouraging. So encouraging that thousands of years later, it lifts my heart. Did it lift your heart to know this truth? That sometimes we need to just be faithful and, and go forward? Sometimes we need to just hold our tongues, quit complaining so much, and just believe and trust and move with Jesus, right? It still thousands of years later resonates with us. If you're someone who highlights or underlines in your Bible, those are verses to highlight right there or to underline. Beautiful thought there. Beautiful thought. The Egyptians that you see today, you shall no more see forever. Do we have that hope? That the sin of this world, the darkness of this world, the confusion of this world, Satan and the demons, we will see them no more forever? That's our hope. Powerful truth. But what you may not know, because it's only implied, we're going to catch it here, it's only implied. What you may not know 
is that Moses doesn't exactly believe what he's saying. Moses is saying what needs to be said. Moses' words are perfect and powerful. This is what you see in the man in front of you. This is what they hear from his lips. But in his heart, there's something else going on. Catch this in verse 15. See if you notice it. Verse 15. Notice now the Lord speaks. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Pause there in our reading for a moment. Did you catch it? Are your spidey senses tingling? Do you understand? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Put the pieces of the puzzle together. Israel, we understand their lack of faith. And they're stating it. And Moses gives this powerful little sermonette that rallies the crowd. And who is Moses speaking to in verses 13 and 14? He's speaking to Israel, right? He's speaking to Israel, and his words are perfect and right on the button. So then why does God say immediately, why are you crying unto me? Did you catch it? Moses was speaking to Israel out loud. Where was he crying out to God? You see, he said what he needed to say, but he wasn't necessarily believing what he was saying. His heart was crying out before God. He was speaking to Israel and said exactly what he needed to say, but there's something missing here. By the way, who writes this story down in the book of Exodus? Who writes it? Moses. So even years later, as he's reflecting on this moment, Moses is still too proud to tell us the truth. I find this interesting. It's like he's saying to himself, hmm, I don't really want to say that I was lacking a faith in my heart, but I don't want to change God's words either. So he puts what God says back to him, but he doesn't tell us what he did to cause God to ask that question. Why is it that we have trouble admitting that we're weak? I'm not the only one, am I? Sometimes we have trouble admitting that we're weak. I've recently started seeing a doctor for my knees. My knees are hurting, and I know why. It's because of what my knees are carrying. And so my doctor has me seeing a nutritionist. I have needed to see a nutritionist for a long time. But I just saw a nutritionist for the first time like a week and a half ago. Because I will be honest, I'm an Adventist. I don't need a nutritionist to tell me nutrition. That's what's going through my mind. It has been for a long time. I've read Ministry of Healing. I've read the book Councils on Diet and Foods. What do I need a nutritionist to tell me what I already know? And I'm a pastor. I tell people this stuff all the time. Why am I the one who needs help with this? I tell people to pray more about it. I tell people that they can be stronger with God. So why aren't I doing these things? Then I met her. She turned out to be a parent. I didn't know this, a parent of one of our students. So I walk in her office. I'm like, oh, I've got to talk to somebody who knows me <laughs> about my innermost fears and issues of food. And then I find out the hardest truth. She's Catholic. Oh, I'm an Adventist. And she says, oh, yeah, you Adventists. I know. I checked out this school. I know your beliefs. You guys have a strong health message. Oh, no, she knows. <laughs> uh, the problem isn't that she's Catholic, but I, in my head, I'm like, oh, no. Someone from another church. He's going to know that an Adventist is weak with nutrition. A pastor of all things. But when I came home from the visit, Sharon asked me how it went. And I said, you know, I don't think I learned anything today. 
But it was really important having someone who's a professional tell me what I need to do. I needed the kick in the butt. I needed someone to say, okay, you're a vegan. This is healthy vegan eating. This is unhealthy vegan eating. You know, Oreos are vegan. <laughs> Potato chips are vegan. I needed somebody to kick me in the tail and say, all right, be a vegan, be a healthy vegan. And it came from someone that maybe at times as a church, especially prophetically, we look, we look down upon. What could they teach me? But I needed that. I needed that kick in the tail. A weight since then has been lifted off my shoulders and no pun intended. It just felt like I needed this wake up call, this little shaking. It's what I needed. Moses, though, is weak in his heart in this story for a moment, causes a momentary delay. Israel, you should know God fights for you. God is on your side. You will never see these Egyptians anymore forever. But in his heart, he's saying, Lord, are you here? Are you going to help? And even years later, as he's recording this story, he does not tell us what he's feeling. He only tells us of God's rebuke. Ellen White, by the way, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 287, uh, mentions about this very second in the story. She says that in the hearts of Israel, hope sprang forth. As they hear the words of Moses, hope springs forth. And they're like, wow, we're never going to see these Egyptians in, anymore. God's going to work for us today. And it's because of his sermonette that they go forward when the sea splits open. But she says that Moses lifted up his voice in prayer. Neither Moses nor Ellen White tell us what his prayer is, but we can see it in the what God asks of him. Moses, well, let's finish the verse. We stopped. Let's start the verse over. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry unto me? Tell the children of Israel to what? Go forward. He did. He just told them that, but he didn't believe what he was saying. It was an outward movement of his lips, but his heart was on a different page of the book. Why are you crying out to me? God is telling Moses, Moses, you know the truth. The truth has set you free. You've just preached the truth. Now go do what you just preached. Go forward. Go forward. Moses has a lack of faith for a moment. But we know the rest of the story, of course, right? The Red Sea opens. They walk through on dry ground. And God's promises are kept. They never see those Egyptians anymore. As Adventists, can we be just as guilty as this? As Moses here? Should we be doing what we believe do we really mean what we say? It's possible that as we preach prophecy and we believe prophecy, that our hearts are not in tune with our message. In spite of their momentary baby faith, and in spite of Moses' temporary lack of faith, God was still able to work. But it caused a delay and I wonder if that delay is what would bother him for the rest of the wilderness wanderings. How would the story of their exodus be written today if he had preached that message and then stepped forward without the pause, without the delay? Maybe the first generation of Israelites would have walked into the promised land. Because that's what they were guilty of when they get to the promise and that delay, right? God says, go forward. No. Okay, don't. Yeah, and they go in. They delayed just like Moses did. So while God can still work and while God was still with his church, our delays are destructive. 
But this truth spoken by Moses still resonates today, and it's still something we could claim today. God is with us. Who can be against us? God can work even in our weaknesses, but we must go forward in letting God work. Let's see another example of our weakness and what exactly is causing this. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, you know this verse. Peter has just declared Jesus as the Christ. And Jesus responds with something so important and beautiful. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Jesus is speaking here. He tells Peter in verse 18. <clears throat> He says, and I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or death shall not prevail against it. Amen. Is that good gospel truth there? The gates of Hades cannot prevail against the church of God and against the rock on which we are built. Okay, so let's identify these pieces. Who's the rock? It's Jesus, right? On this rock, he's saying. Then you have the church and you have the promise that the gates of Hades or death representing the powers of Satan cannot prevail. But I wonder as Adventists if we get so caught up in trying to show that Peter's not the rock that we miss the gospel for us. Sometimes we miss it because we know the truth, but we miss the heart behind the truth. So let's slow down for a moment. We know Jesus is the rock. Why exactly does Jesus say the gates of hell, of Hades, of death, of the grave, shall not prevail against us? Are gates offensive? Do gates go on the attack? Do gates attack the church? Why does he say gates? He doesn't say the soldiers, the swords, the fire-breathing dragons, the gates of Hades. Gates don't hunt. Gates don't chase. Gates do not attack. What do gates do? They can either close to keep people out or they can be open to let people in. Are the gates of Hades closed to, let people, to keep people out? No. So we know these gates are wide open. What Jesus is saying is that the church is built on him, the rock. But we're weak because the invitation to the world is right in front of us at all times. At any point, we as individuals can turn and walk into those gates. We're weak. We're fragile. He's saying, be careful. By the way, Jesus also says he's the open door. And so that right there is the great controversy. We have a decision to make it every moment of the day and every day to walk through the gates of Hades or the gates of life in Jesus. We, there is always in every moment, in every conversation, in every workday, in every moment, a decision to make. Am I built in this gate, on this rock, in Jesus? Or am I going to do this my way and walk through the gates of death? There's always a choice before us. The church is fragile, he's saying. It's a building, but it can be strong, but it can only be strong if it's built on the rock of ages. The church is fragile. And in the midst of a war, and our only safety is not from within the church, our safety is built on Christ Amen. alone. Amen. Another verse here, Jeremiah. Let's jump to Jeremiah. The lamenting prophet tells us this, Jeremiah chapter 17. This really sums up our theme for this quarter on mistakes, the mistakes of relying on ourselves. This sums it up so well. Jeremiah chapter 17, 
And notice what he says in verse 8. This is beautiful here. This is what we want to be. Verse 8. For he, that's us, that's you and I, that's the church. For he shall be like a tree planted where? By the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river. And will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Amen. Who's the living water of the river? Jesus Christ. And so the church is to be planted like a tree by the water. Amen. The river that does not um, disappear in drought. It's always there flowing. Our roots can be firmly planted and getting all the water from Jesus we need. But I want you to catch the sandwich it makes. This is great in verse 8. This is wonderful. This is what we need. But I want you to notice verse 7 and verse 9 because when we look at the sandwich, we understand that it's not a guarantee for us to be planted by the waters. It's a choice we make. Here's verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Now notice verse 9. Here's the other side of the coin. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Do you see the sandwich there it made? Blessed is he whose hope and trust is in the Lord. But you've got to be careful because the, 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 the heart, our desires are deceitful and they're lie to, they lie to us and they're wicked. But if you plant your roots by the river, the water of life, if you trust in the Lord, drought means nothing to you. You will produce fruit, which we know from Jesus are the actions of the saints. It's not a guarantee in our church membership that we're right with God. We have to choose daily to walk with him, to be planted on the rock of ages, and to be planted by the river of the water of life. So when we turn to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is very honest with the church. It's very open and detailed in the options that we have. The church itself has two sides. It can be the harlot or it can be the virgin. And when the book reveals to us the virgin's characteristics, it's all positive. We have a triumphant message and a mission to reveal Jesus to the world. The faithful church in Revelation is spotless. It follows the lamb wherever he goes. It's clothed by the sun. It's protected through the midst of persecution. In the end, Jesus rescues his bride and the church militant eternally becomes church triumphant. We know that truth. And we define ourselves as part of that system. And we reject the parts of that system. And that's a good choice. But it's not automatic. It's not guaranteed. It's a walk with God daily. Decides in which church we stand, where we're built, and where we get our water and our sustenance. At the very heart of the story of Revelation is the story of our own Advent message. While we do not teach that only Adventists are saved, we do teach and we know that we have the clearest presentation of the gospel. But the truth of the matter, the truth of Revelation, is that it's not enough to be a Seventh-day Adventist. It is not enough to attend a Seventh-day Adventist church. Sabbath-keeping does not save us. The creator of the Sabbath is who saves us, and that's why we keep the Sabbath. It is not enough to believe the Bible truths. We have to walk and claim the Bible truths. All these things are true and wonderful. 
But at the very heart, it tells us that we cannot and will not be saved simply by where we attend church. What matters is who is the head of that church. We need the head of the church. We need the rock of that church. We need the redeemer of that church. We are not invincible, but he is. We are not safe, but he is safety. We are a vulnerable church, but we have an invulnerable leader. He's our mediator in heaven, and he loves us. His gates are open every moment to us. Um, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 8. It's a little long here. It's two paragraphs. I'll try to go through it a little slowly just because I know, like me, we, we will lose attention. Page 247, she says this. She says, our position, the church's position, Adventist position, our position in the world is not what it should be. We are far from where we should have been had our Christian experience been in harmony with the light and opportunity given us. Did you catch that? We should have finished this work by now is what she's saying. We should be further along in the path of righteousness than where we are. We have too much light and been given too much opportunity to be asleep at the will. She continues, it is difficult to discern between him that serveth God and him that does not serve God. And then she says, in the balances, in the judgment, in the, the weights, in the balances of the sanctuary, the Seventh-day Adventist church is to be weighed. She will be judged by the privileges and advantages that she has been given. Wow. That should be humbling. We have a more clear picture of Jesus. That what that means is we have a bigger responsibility to him. If her spiritual experience does not correspond to the advantages that Christ at infinite cost has given her, if the blessings conferred have not qualified her to do the work entrusted to her, on her will be pronounced the sentence found wanting. By the light given, by the opportunities given, will she be judged. I don't believe she's saying that we're part of Babylon. I believe what she's saying is that we can be if we want to be. If we don't choose to let Christ be the head of our church and of our lives. She says, if, that's an important word there. It's possible for us to be found wanting in the great judgment. That is humbling. The church itself is not invincible. The church needs Jesus. We need Jesus. You may be thinking, the ship though makes it safely to the harbor, Pastor. The church survives, and that's true. But the ship is not the church. Seventh Adventist Church is not the ship in which she's speaking of. We're going to look at this in a moment here. When she says the ship makes it safely to harbor, the ship is not the church. The church are those on the ship. Do we have a story that in the Bible that reflects about people being safe on a boat in the midst of a storm? Was Noah the ark? Were his sons the ark? No. By the grace of God and by the power of God and the instruction of God, they built the ark, but they were safe inside the ark. The church was inside the ship. So here's what she says. Letter 46, 1887. I keep saying to myself, this is God's work. This is God's cause. He has greater interest for all these places and all these churches than any of us poor mortals can possibly have. This is good news, by the way, everyone, that the church is weak and fragile because Jesus is in charge. It's okay to admit that we're weak. 
She's saying he loves the causes more than we do, more than we possibly could. If we tried, if we were perfect, he still has a greater love and care for the poor and for the needy. And then she says this, Jesus stands at the helm, at the wheel of the ship. Jesus stands at the helm. He will ever be sure to guide the ship safely into the harbor. I know we have the truth. I know that every soul who endures faithful to the end will be saved. You see, the ship goes wherever the person at the helm directs it. So we cannot be the ship because Jesus is at the helm and the ship goes wherever he tells it to go. We are the ones deciding if we want to be on the ship. She says, those who endure faithfully, those who are standing on the ship going, okay, God, you've got the will. Jesus, you're at the helm. We are the passengers. He is our captain. The harbor is eternity. So what is the ship? Six times in her writings, she calls it, quote, the gospel ship. The ship is the gospel. It's the gospel. For example, letter 37, 1887. She says, I know. I love how many times in these verses or in these, in these thoughts she uses that phrase, I know. I know the captain of our salvation stands at the helm to guide the gospel ship into harbor. The captain of our salvation stands at the helm. Amen? Amen. He is at the helm of the gospel. I grew up uh, in the Clovis Seventh-day Adventist Church right across these mountains, and the church happened to be on Helm Avenue. And so the logo of the church was Jesus standing there at the helm of a ship. And as a little kid, every time, even as I grew up, every time I saw that logo, I used to look forward to the church newsletter back in the days when things came through the mail. Remember that thing called mail? Snail mail? I used to look forward to grabbing the church newsletter, and I would sit there and stare at the logo of the church. Jesus at the helm gave me goosebumps, even as a kid. The captain of our salvation stands at the helm. But here's what we need to learn today, everyone. Who carries the ship? You see, we believe that we carry the gospel. No. The ship is the gospel. We are the passengers. The gospel carries us. When Jesus is at the helm, the good news of the Bible carries us through the storm of life. Amen. And our job is to invite others onto the ship, to bring others to the gospel. The gospel does not need to be carried. I think this is why in Revelation it says that it's angels who provide the everlasting gospel. Because it's God's gospel. It's his work. We are the vessel in which it comes to others. It's not ours. It's ours in responsibility. But it's not ours in possession. It's his message. It's his gospel. And the good news carries us through the hardships of life. This is the message of the church, the mission of the church, to let Jesus be at the helm and to let the gospel carry us to the harbor. Amen. 